Psalm 16, The Golden Secret. Keep me safe, O mighty God. I run for dear life to you, my safe place. So I said to the Lord, you are my maker, my mediator and my master. Any good thing you find in me has come from you. And he said to me, my holy lovers are wonderful. My majestic ones, my glorious ones, fulfilling all my desires. Yet there are those who yield to weaknesses and they will have troubles and sorrows unending. I never gather with such ones nor give them honour in any way. Lord, I have chosen you alone as my inheritance. You are my prize, my pleasure and my portion. I leave my destiny and its timing in your hands. Your pleasant path leads me to pleasant places. I'm overwhelmed with the privileges that come with following you, for you have given me the best. The way you counsel and correct me makes me praise you more. For your whispers in the night give me wisdom, showing me what to do next. Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken. For I experience your wraparound presence every moment. My heart and soul explode with joy, full of glory. Even my body will rest confident and secure. For you will not abandon me to the realm of death, nor will you allow your Holy One to experience corruption. For you bring me a continual revelation of resurrection life the path to the bliss that brings me face to face with you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is David Rogers. I'm one of the members here at Cosham Baptist Church. I want to tell you a familiar story. The backstory many of you will remember. It's an Old Testament story about the prophet Elijah. And he's challenged the prophets of the ungodly King Ahab of Israel and his wife, Queen Jezebel, an even more ungodly person, to a contest. Who's real? Baal or God Almighty? Now we know the answer as the Lord God of Israel sends fire from heaven to consume both the soaking wet sacrifice and even the stones they were laid on. And then the 400 prophets of Baal are put to death. And then for the first time in three and a half years, it rains. But evil Queen Jezebel is, is not a happy bunny and she lets Elijah know she's out to kill him. And Elijah runs for his life. We pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19 and I'm going to read it to you from the message. Ahab reported to Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the massacre of the prophets. Jezebel immediately sent messengers to Elijah with her threat. The gods will get you for this and I'll get even with you. By this time tomorrow, you'll be as dead as any one of the prophets. When Elijah saw how things were, he ran for dear life to Beersheba, far in the south of Judah. He left his young servant there and went on into the desert another day's journey. He came to a lone broom bush and collapsed in its shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all, to just die. Enough of this, God. Take my life. I'm ready to join my ancestors in the grave. Exhausted, he fell asleep under the lone broom bush. Suddenly, an angel shook him awake and said, get up and eat. He looked around and, to his surprise, right by his head were a loaf of of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel of God came back, shook him awake again and said, get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, ate and drank his fill and set out. Nourished by that meal, he walked 40 days and nights all the way to the mountain of God, to Horeb. And when he got there, 
he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of God came to him. So, Elijah, what are you doing here? I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel army, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They've destroyed the places of worship. They've murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. Then he was told, go, stand on the mountain, attention before God. God will pass by. A hurricane ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God. But God wasn't to be found in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle and quiet whisper. When Elijah heard the quiet voice, he muffled his face with his great cloak, went to the mouth of the cave and stood there. A quiet voice asked, So, Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? Elijah said it again. I've been working my heart out for God, the God of the angel armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. God said, go back the way you came. And he goes on and gives to Elijah instructions for what to do next. It's a curious turnaround of events, isn't it? Elijah fails at the very point where he appears to have been the strongest. Does this sound familiar? So did meet Moses. Faith fueled Abraham, patient Job. And we see God in this story providing miraculous rest and replenishment after the 80 mile jog to Beersheba, then another 200 miles to Mount Horeb. And so we come to the mountaintop experience. So I guess you're wondering, where are we going with all this? Elijah is depressed and discouraged and he needs a personal encounter, a personal God encounter. He needs to experience God as presence. This is now our fifth in the series on It Is Well using Psalm 16 as our series text and we've come to verses 8 and 9. Our title is Confidence Because of Presence. The NIV reads like this, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. The Passion Translation that we've already heard from Jan puts it like this, Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken, for I experience your wraparound presence every moment. My heart and soul explode with joy, full of glory. Even my body will rest confident and secure. I believe what the Lord wants us to take away today is this. I want you to experience my presence, not just know it in your head. The dictionary defines presence as a personal thing that exists or is present in a place but is not seen. I find it interesting as we read the NIV that the spiritual reality of experiencing God's presence gives physical relief. The psalmist mentions eyes, hand, heart, tongue and body. So what do we mean by the presence of God? The Hebrew word translates as face, which implies a close personal encounter. In scripture there are a range of situations with different reactions to this presence. Adam and Eve hid from the presence of God after they disobeyed him. Isaiah was painfully conscious of his sinfulness. Samson's dad said I'm going to die because I've seen God's angel and Jonah tries to run away from the presence of the Lord. Jeremiah in chapter 5 and 22 suggests an appropriate response to God's presence. 
Should you not fear me, declares the Lord, should you not tremble in my presence? For the Jewish nation, the temple was the literal place of God's presence. We read in 2 Chronicles 4 about the bread of the presence, reminding the people of the closeness of God Almighty. Of course, heaven is filled with God's presence. It's the place where angels dwell. If you remember, Gabriel speaking to Zechariah says, I am Gabriel and I dwell in the presence of God. And the writer to Hebrews in Hebrews 9.24 tells us that Jesus entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. And of course, ultimately, we will all see God face to face. As the writer John says in his first book, John, uh, 1 John 3 verse 2, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Don't know about you, but one of my often go to verses is a promise found in Hebrews 13, verse 5. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 20, 31, verses 6 and 7, when Moses gives his departing speech to the children of Israel and commissions the new leader, Joshua, with this promise do not be afraid or terrified for the Lord your God goes with you he will never leave you nor forsake you on the 19th of April last year I wrote on reading this in the margin of my Bible today we have crises but I sense God is saying I am going before you trust me you see we were going through some family crises and also experienced the death of a very dear friend unexpectedly. I find it easy to forget that when God himself came to earth, his redemptive name was Emmanuel, God with us. Many of us feel fearful from time to time. Being a Christian doesn't make us immune from that. But in my experience, when I come deeper into God's presence and stop focusing only on the problem, the fear loses its power. I've been uh, looking recently at the life of King David and recently passed the episode with Goliath and I wondered, when David saw Goliath, what did he see? A giant? Certain death? I believe he saw the God of deliverance in whose tangible presence he knew confidence to face even a giant. Like Jezebel to Elijah, Goliath says to David, I am going to kill you. So does David run away? No. He says to Goliath, you come before me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come before you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Compare that to all the other Israelites. They only saw the giant. They knew every minute detail about him. They knew he was a nine and a half foot champion with a bronze helmet on his head and a coat of scale armour weighing 5,000 shekels. They knew he had bronze greaves and they knew he had a javelin and even a spear which weighed 600 shekels. They knew all there was to know about the giant, but they'd lost sight of God. David saw the giant not in relation to his own strength, but to God's. That's true for me too. I know everything about my giant. How about you? You could probably tell me in minute detail everything about your giant, about your illness, your relationship difficulties, family issues. You could tell me dates and times and who said what and when. But have we lost sight of the Lord in all of it? Hebrews 12 puts it this way. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith, so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. So in this time of pandemic, I wonder what we see. Is God present in my experience? Some people know nothing about God. They just want to feel something supernatural, like new ageists, spiritualists, but they don't know who they're looking for. 
Others know everything about God. They've got perfect theology. They could quote you a systematic theology about the attri attributes of God, but they've never experienced him in a tangible way. It's never moved from the head to the heart. Paul puts it like this in Ephesians 3. Yes, I want you to know about God, how long, wide, high and deep is his love. But more than that, I want you to know that love which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to all the measure of the fullness of Christ. You see, we have an experiential faith, not a theoretical one. Psalm 16 talks about seeing it, feeling it, knowing it. A tangible I am with you always. A constant wraparound presence. Wow. You know, in the lockdown, when Jen and I see friends and family in this time of social distancing, we give people a virtual hug. I think that probably hugging our grandchildren has been what we've missed most at the moment. Jan often says, I just want to sniff them again. Jesus said to his disciples it was for their good that he was going away in order that they might receive the Holy Spirit, a constant seal of his presence in their lives and ours. So what are some practical ways I can experience God's presence? First, we need to give him time. For me, the most important part of my day is my quiet time, time to be silent before God, time to read and listen to what God says in his word. I need to learn to scour scripture to make it a part of me. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. So we need to listen to read, to study, to meditate on, to memorise God's word. You might like to try the Bible in one year app if you find reading a struggle or prefer someone else to read to you. Secondly, learn to pay attention to God. Yes, I know it's really difficult when you're parents with young children and in the rush of the day at work. One psychologist writes this, the secret of happiness is presence to the moment. Mary Oliver puts it like this, attention is the beginning of devotion. And Jerry last week said that God was most interested not in what I am doing, but who I am becoming. You see, what I pay attention to determines who I'm becoming. The year 2008 was the year the smartphone took off in the UK. And in the decade that followed, 78% of adults by 2018, according to Ofcom, had one. And 95% of 16 to 24 year olds. And the smartphone is now the device that people say they would miss the most. It dominates people's lives. People in the UK apparently now check their smartphone every 12 minutes of the waking day. Two in five adults first look at their phone within five minutes of waking up, whereas in those under the age of 35, it's about two thirds. John Mark Comer calls it the digital carnivore, an epidemic of hurried digital distraction. Or as a recent TED talk put it, when you wake up, if you look at your phone before you look at your partner, you've got a problem. Lastly, Thanksgiving and praise are key to presence. They're an eternal pathway to God's presence. As the psalmist writes, and I'm sure you can fill in the gaps in Psalm 100 verse 4, say it with me, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. I know this can be harder during lockdown or when we're going through a tough time, but then there's even more reason to do it. So with this in mind, as we draw to a close, I'd like to spend a few minutes doing a little exercise together. I started doing this three or four years ago and I found it really helpful. It's called the examine. It's a way of praying by looking at what's happened in your life in the last 24 hours. There's a method to it, first suggested nearly 500 years ago by Ignatius Loyola, 
the founder of the Jesuits. It goes like this. First, we ask God for the grace to see our lives through his eyes and not our own. Second, we give thanks because gratitude is the context for this prayer. Third, we look back on the day and the events of the day we've just looked through to see those times when God was especially present. Fourth, we look at what's wrong, in what ways we've fallen short. Finally, we look at the day ahead. How are we going to love God and other people tomorrow? The purpose of the examine is to find God in your life. It's a framework you can do at any time you like. I like to do it first thing in the morning, but lunchtime or evening may work best for you. You see, reflecting on our daily lives is a good way to pray to God, because God is part of our everyday lives. In the words of the French philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, God is not removed from us. He is at the point of my pen, my shovel, my paintbrush, my needle and my heart and thoughts. In other words, God is present when I eat, when I brush my teeth, when I travel to work, when I write emails. Or as the Irish poet Patrick Kavanagh says, God is in the bits and pieces of every day. So let's go through one together. Don't be embarrassed in the silences where I pause. Let's start by shutting out distractions as much as possible. Sit somewhere quiet, maybe kneel, close your eyes. You might want to pause this video if you watch back later on and maybe find a quiet place or if you're watching live, come back to it and later on catch up. Go to that private place in your heart where you can be at peace. Ask God to shine his light. Ask him for the grace to pray, to see, to understand. So as you rest in his presence, give thanks for every aspect of your life. All of your blessings come from God's hand. Imagine bathing in God's light and look at your life with gratitude. Now, in the spirit of gratitude, review the events of the past day. Imagine watching a movie of your last 24 hours. What did you do? Who were you with? Where did you go? What especially stands out? Look for those times when God was particularly present. Now recall a time in your day when your feelings were particularly intense. They can be good or bad feelings, happiness, contentment, or anger, sadness, irritation. Ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Take a moment to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Now look at what went wrong. Focus on just one or two things. Let these memories come to the surface. Ask for God's forgiveness if you were at fault. Ask him for ways to improve. Finally, look forward to the day ahead. What are you going to be doing who will you be with? Think about this for a few moments. Ask God, what one thing should I do in the day ahead? Listen 
to his answer. Ask God, what else do you want to say to me? You might like to end this examine by praying the Lord's Prayer with me. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dave. That was really great. Full of the Holy Spirit and challenging and encouraging in equal measure. You know, it's not about the table, whether it's square or round, kitchen table or dining room table, coffee table or lap tray. It's not about the chairs, plastic or wooden, comfy or not. It's not about the food, although it helps if it's been cooked with love. A good meal is enjoyed best when we turn off the TV and our mobile phones and concentrate on those we're with. I love gathering around the table, enjoying a good chat with friends and family and talking about a multitude of topics. However, instant technology has made it difficult. Sometimes we're more concerned with what others, sometimes many miles away, are saying than we are with what those around our table are saying to us. This morning we've been invited to another meal at the table when we come here to celebrate together the Lord's Supper. And as we have this simple meal, I want to encourage you to look at your surroundings. You may be at your kitchen table, your dining table, you may be around your coffee table. You may uh, have things on your lap because you're on your sofa. When it comes to this meal, it's not about the church, whether it's big or small. As much as we'd love to be having this meal all together in our building, it's not about that. It's not about the type of bread that we have. It's not about whether we have wine or juice before us. It's about turning off our thoughts from our worries and concerns and focusing on Jesus. When was the last time we enjoyed being at the Lord's table? Do we enjoy his presence or are we more concerned with what's going on somewhere else? This is important for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death that he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. These words come from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians where he said, For this is what the Lord himself has said about this table. And I have passed it on to you before, that on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and said to his disciples, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death that he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. So if anyone eats this bread and drinks from this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he is guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why we should examine ourselves carefully before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. And so let's do that now, shall we? Let's have a moment of quiet where we bring our lives to God and then we'll have a prayer of forgiveness 
and thanks. Father, we know we are far from perfect and we mess up far too often. Thank you that this meal reminds us that you have made a way for us to come to you and to the, receive the forgiveness that you offer. And so, Father, as individuals, we want to say sorry to you right now for the times and things we have done that would take us away from you. Thank you that your forgiveness is for all and is for all ways. Thank you that you made a way for us to live with and for you. And now God of grace, we wanna give you thanks for this bread and this drink and your son, Jesus Christ, who came to save us. The love of Jesus that shines through the years that we wanna thank you for his death on the cross, that his body was broken, that he has become the bread of life which sustains us. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us to the end of your life and that you love us still. Thank you for allowing your blood to be poured out for us so that we might have life in its truest form. The words thank you do not seem enough, but as we say thank you, we seek to give you our hearts anew and afresh. Amen. As we eat this bread, it reminds us that we are part of his body, living for him. Friends, the body of Christ broken for you. We drink remembering Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. His love which has never ended. His love which sustains us all. Friends, the blood of Christ was shed for you. Let's pray together. God of grace, thank you for raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope for life eternal. Holy Spirit, fill us with your strength to be the body of Christ on earth. God's church, whether in Laos or Los Angeles, in Hawaii and Havana, in Ethiopia and Edmonton, and here in Kosham or wherever it is that you're watching and listening to this service. Give us strength to do the work you would have us do, to be the people you would have us be. And most of all, give us hope as we wait together to see Jesus again. Amen. Friends, before we close uh, this service today, let's sing the song that we've been singing throughout this series. As we worship God, we lift our voices as we sing the song, It Is Well. Bless you and thank you. Bye-bye.